I wonder for you, when you're old and 33, <laughs> how, many, how many jokes about your area you will have tucked away? All right, so last time we were talking about indeterminate forms. Oh, here's a conceptual question I didn't put on that list. What is an indeterminate form? I tried to put this in a definition last time, and I don't know how well it turned out, actually. So we have these numbers, like 0 over 0, infinity over infinity. We, right at the end, started talking about this. What is 0 times infinity? And every single time I put these guys in quotes, because I'm not really saying 0 divided by 0. I'm talking about something that becomes 0 and something that becomes 0, and we take the quotient. Something that goes as big as we want it to go, something that is as big as we want it to be, and we divide the two. Something that goes to zero and something that gets as big as we want it to be. What are these fractions or products or powers we'll talk about in a bit? These are all indeterminate forms because if you naively think about them, these things actually become zero divided by zero and infinity divided by infinity. And there's no way to determine without some analysis what these things actually are. Which brought us to Le Hopital's rule? Which said, if we have some information about these guys, they're differentiable, right? That's the, kind of the big one. If we want to know the limit as x goes to a of a function over another function, then satisfying certain conditions, star, 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 right there, then we can just take derivatives and evaluate the new limit of the ratio of derivatives. Some of those requirements, again, were we have to be able to differentiate these guys. The derivative of g can't be 0 always. The limits of f and g need to be 0 and 0, or infinity and infinity. Right? And if that's the case, then we can do stuff like this. And we can say what this derivative is, in fact it's this, if this limit actually exists, which is not guaranteed by the theorem. It's entirely possible that you could start off with a function and another function like this, and you have an indeterminate form, you take derivatives, and you do not get a limit that actually exists. In which case, Le Hopital's rule is just in sort of an ambiguous case. You could do it, but you can't do it. So, you just up a creek. So, we ended last time talking about this last form, and I gave an example of sort of generic functions, and I said, well, let's say f is a function that's differentiable, and as x goes to a, this is 0, and we have another function which is differentiable, and its limit is infinity, and I'm asking this. What's the limit of x going to a of f times g? I suggested we could do some manipulation of one of these functions in order to get something like this, one of these first two cases. Because these are the two that the Hopital's rule is written for. This third case is not one of the ones the Hopital's is written for, but it is one that we can actually manipulate, we can massage it a little bit to turn it into something like this. Okay? So this is what we want to find. But it's 
it's not one of these two forms, the question is, how can we turn it into one of these two forms? So if I know that the limit of g of x as x goes to a is infinity, maybe you can tell me what this limit is. This is where we ended in silence. Where we begin in silence. <laughs> so, what do you think? G just gets bigger and bigger and bigger the closer x goes to a. So, what happens to this fraction, 1 over? It's very similar to another example, 1 over x. x goes to infinity. This guy just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So, what about the ratio? Zero. Right? Same thing here. The denominator just keeps growing. You're taking one and you're dividing it by first ten and then a hundred and then a thousand and then a billion and then a Googleplex and now you're like point a thousand zeros one. And it doesn't stop there, it just keeps going. So you start listing all those zeros and eventually this thing turns into zero repeating one. And you never actually write down that one because there's a zero repeating in front of it forever, which is the same as nothing. And this is the trick, because f times g of x is the same as f divided by 1 over g of x. So if you have something in indeterminate form of 0 times infinity, you can rewrite it using this handy little trick. In order to get an indeterminate form, G is differentiable, right? if we suppose G is differentiable, can we differentiate 1 over G which rule would you use? Quotient rule. Top function is 1, bottom function is G. So this is going to be negative G prime divided by G squared. Right? You can take its derivative. You can still take the derivative of f, we haven't changed that. And so we have, according to Le tals rule, a function divided by another function which we can differentiate and which has a naive limit of 0 over 0. Bingo. So we take the derivative of f, we take the derivative of 1 over g prime, or sorry, 1 over g, and we take this new limit. Maybe that derivative exists. 
Maybe that limit, sorry, is what I meant. Maybe that limit exists. And maybe it's something that we can easily find, whereas we couldn't find the first. So this is the first little trick. In order to take something that is not explicitly described by the Hoppy Paul's rule, in order to give you something that the Hoppy Paul's rule can be applied to. So what's a nice example of this? x times natural log of x. We're going to take the limit as x goes to 0 from the right. We have to put that in there because natural log isn't defined for negatives. So we'll just naively think about this. Let's just press on thinking, hey, everything's going to work out fine. As x goes to 0, what happens to x? It also becomes 0 because x is becoming 0, so x is 0. What about natural log of x? Well, when you plug in numbers closer and closer to 0, natural log, remember, looks like this. When you plug in numbers closer and closer to 0, natural log goes further and further down. This is actually times negative infinity. Right? And limits don't care about signs, so we could take this outside the limit more or less think of it like this. And then this turns into 0 times infinity, and everything's OK. That's what we've done so far. OK? So this is essentially the form 0 times infinity. So we can apply the Hopital's rule by looking at something similar. We can either take this as our function and take 1 over it. We can think of this as the function we're going to do 1 over. I don't have a preference. One's really easy to differentiate as it is. Let's do natural log divided by 1 over x. about this naively. What's the limit of this? That's the negative infinity we have before, up here. As x goes to 0 from the right, the bottom is 1 over ridiculously small numbers, which is infinity. So we're in this case now which is something the Hopital's rule can be applied to. Okay. I'm exampling it this way. Before we went for 0 over 0, but you can use them both. If I had chosen natural log to be in the bottom, 1 over natural log, and I chose x to be up here instead, we'd be in the 0 over 0 case just like we had over there. But natural log is easier to differentiate than 1 over natural log. And 1 over x is easy to differentiate because it's just a power rule. So we have the situation infinity over infinity. These are both differentiable within a region close to 0, within their domains. They're both continuous in that space. So we can take derivatives. Derivative of the top is 1 over x. Derivative of the bottom is 1 over x. Let me rewrite it. I'll keep it here, but let me rewrite it. <clears throat> this is the same as x to the negative first. Apply the power rule. Negative 1 times x 
x to the negative 2. Right? Which is 1 over x squared. Yeah? Oh boy, did I make it worse? This is a lot better. Does anyone in here divide by fractions? No? Or have, have I trained that out of you yet? No one divides by fractions, right? If I give you a fraction and I want you to divide it by another fraction, what do you do? Keep, change, flip. Keep, change, wait, change, and then flip. Do that here. Fraction divided by fraction. Keep this one. Change the division to multiplication. Flip the bottom one. Oh man, that's a lot nicer. Because that simplifies to a very, very easy number. divided by x, negative x. So some number goes to 0, another number goes to infinity. When you take the limit of their product, the one that went to 0 did it faster than the one that went to infinity x goes to 0 faster than the natural log goes to infinity. So in this limit, the product goes to 0. This is a case where 0 times infinity is 0, and not something else. OK? So I assume forms like this, we should be good with. Right? Yes? How do you know a goes to 0 faster? That's what we just determined. Yeah, yeah. This is a derivative, right? This is a derivative, yeah? The rate of change of these functions is what we're talking about. This is how quickly the y values are changing. So we ask ourselves, what's the ratio of this function's rate of change to this function's rate of change? Yeah? That ratio goes to zero, which means however quickly this one goes up is dwarfed. Like a lot by how quickly this one goes down. Yeah? So eventually the the ratio of these two guys is ridiculous. It's this one is so close to zero and this one's barely moved anywhere. Because this one goes so fast to zero and this one goes so fast or so slowly to infinity. Yeah? Makes sense? Good. Yeah, you can think of it like a, a race. Two cars initially start off with different accelerations. Let's suppose they maintain those accelerations. For the first second of the race, they're pretty close, right? But eventually, because one acceleration is bigger than the other, the distance between them, oof, it just grows and grows and grows. Eventually, the guy in the front looks back, and they say, wow, they're way back there, right? Okay. A natural question would be, are there other forms which we can turn into these two? There are. <laughs> Lots. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have time for them all. On your review sheet that you grabbed earlier, under La Hopital's rule for finding limits, you can write down these three indeterminate forms next to that.
that's what you can write down. We're going to move on to the next section. Questions about the use of independent forms? If we have extra time, maybe at the end of the class, we can go through more. But the rest of them are just infinities, minus infinities. So there's a trick for manipulating them to get into this. There's zeros to zeros, infinities to infinities, ones to infinities, all these different little forms which you can perform some trick to get to these two. Right? And then you apply Le Hopital's rule. So test, test will require knowledge of Le Hopital's rule and knowledge of how to turn something like that into something like these to use love tall, not the other indeterminate forms. Okay? Uh, just standard algebraic tricks. some point in the future you need to use one of them, like after the class, well then you've made it a lot, you know, a lot further in math, and that's great, and I assume by then you'll be able to look back and read that section and be like, yes, we're good. Um, from experience, unless you go into analysis, you're not going to use those tricks. So, here we go, 4.5. I almost want to just put a check mark next to this because 4.5 is literally titled Summary of Curve Sketching. So you're quit, more or less. Something we also talked about in 4.3. An example in 4.3. And then on Wednesday, did another example of. Right? 4.5 more or less just gives you a big to do about hey, we've got all these tools now, derivatives, first and second, that we can use to curve or sketch most curves, most differentiable curves. So, let me just quickly go through key points. And this is sort of a list of steps you can go through if you want to know how a function uh, behaves. So the first thing you need to ask yourself with any function, any function at all, is what is its domain? Remember that a domain is just those numbers which you can plug into it. It's a set of numbers that you know this rule can be applied to without any problems at all. Now, we remember that there's a nice linking between a function's domain and a function's derivative's domain. We know that there's also nice links between function composition and function domains. So this, this very basic task of finding, hey, what numbers can you plug into a function? It has big ramifications down the line in these powerful tools like derivatives. Okay. Intercepts. Intercepts, remember, are x and y axis locations where the function crosses. Sometimes these x intercepts are called roots or zeros. The y intercept is just called that. Sometimes it's also called an initial value. We can find these by setting the 
original function equal to zero in solving, and by plugging in zero in solving. The latter, the latter one, the one on the right, tells you the y-intercept. You just plug in zero. First one, when you set the whole function equal to zero and solve, that gives you the x-intercepts. If I had given you intercepts, would that have impacted your quiz this morning? Yeah, actually, it would have, it would have dictated exactly some locations for where your function goes through. So the big family of functions that you could have written down would be narrowed in a lot. Right? So suddenly you can't give it any x-intercept. Suddenly you can't give it any y-intercept. You need to have specifically a certain set. And then C, this is really just like a, this is kind of an advanced thing to think about. Uh, I would suggest you don't really need to think about this much. But it's here. You physicists will like it. What is the symmetry? What is the symmetric pattern? Is there any symmetry? Remember, symmetry, we talked about this a bit, even and oddness, but there's more than that. All sorts of symmetries. And the symmetries just get harder when you're not working on a surface, a flat surface. Um, how many of you? How many? When you're working on flat surfaces, there's only so many symmetries you can work with. When you're not working on a flat surface, now there's possibly new symmetries you can talk about. So if you've never thought about designing wallpapers or painting something that's symmetric or coming up with a design for a soccer ball, or volleyball, or anything like that, you might have considered symmetries. And maybe you have thought about how there's new symmetries. I don't know, maybe not. But this is really like a kind of an advanced thing to think about, because you can graph a function without knowing the symmetries. You just graph it. The next thing that you usually think about when you're graphing a function or sketching a function is thinking about the asymptotes. These are horizontal and vertical. So does your function level off at any horizontal line? Does your function, oh, so I've got something that does that. Does your function rocket to infinity and then come back down like that? We have a vertical asymptote. The one on the right is a source of a discontinuity. The one on the left is also called end behavior. The next thing usually you think about is intervals of increasing and intervals of decreasing. More or less, where is our function going up? Where is our function going down? We saw that in the quiz. I'm going to skip ahead. I think it's the point G, and then I'll come back to point F. Yep. We also think about intervals for positive and negative concavity. Where does our function look like a smiley face and where does it look like a sad face? Both of these two things can be used, this one in the first derivative, this one in the second derivative test, to find f, which are local and absolute uh, max and mins. Now this is a, kind of a long list, and it involves a lot of tools that we've studied so far. 
what is the domain of our function, what can we plug in, B, where does it cross the axis, C, is there anything symmetric about the graph, can we just graph half of it and then reflect the other way, can we say that our function repeats itself every so often, is it periodic, that might help us graphing larger portions of the graph. Are there any horizontal leveling offs? Are there any vertical asymptotes that we need to worry about? Uh, e and G, where is it going up, where is it coming down, where is it looking like a certain model function? And then F, how high does it go up, how low does it go down? All of these things can enable you, if you were to go through this list, they can enable you to give a pretty darn good sketch of a curve. Okay. So let's say I didn't have a graphing utility, but I needed to know for some reason what the curve for this function looks like. Okay. Let's just go through this set of steps, ask ourselves along the way different things, and we'll uh, eventually arrive at some good guess for what the graph looks like. Okay. That's what this whole section is about. So hey. What's its domain? Yes? All real numbers besides positive and negative 1. You sure? Pretty sure? Who votes yes? Who votes no? Okay, everyone agrees. You found that by setting x minus 1 equaling x minus 1 to 0. And that implies that x is plus or minus 1, because that's the plus or minus root of 1. Great job. Uh, I don't mean to make you doubt yourself. You did a great job. I just want to, yeah, okay. We can't divide by 0 is the point. If I had a radical in here, you might also need to include areas where there's a negative under the radical. If you've got logs in here, you've got to worry about negatives in logs. Right? Okay? So all the sorts of things we've talked about. Great job. So... This is a description of the domain. Another description would be negative infinity to negative 1 together with negative 1 to 1 together with 1 to infinity. Another set notation uh, would be the set of all numbers such that x is not plus or minus 1. Okay, all reals, I guess we could say. Uh, however you prefer. That's great. B. What are the intercepts? The so easiest one is first y-intercept. We just plug in 0. Okay, so I, I know a point now where this curve is. It's at the point 0, 0 right through the origin. X-intercepts. We set our function equal to zero, and we try our best to solve. fraction can only be zero when some number divided by another number and that's zero. When can that possibly be zero? Huh? A little louder? One of them is zero, but definitely not the bottom because we can't divide by zero. So at the top. Right? Zero divided by anything is definitely zero. Unless the bottom is zero. Okay. So if we rule out these two guys, 
then we know x squared minus 1 is not 0. And then we've got something divided by non-zero, and that has to be zero when the top is zero. So, x equals what? Zero. Because the only number that when you square it is zero is itself zero. Okay, so we found the x-intercept. What's its multiplicity? How many of those zeros were there? Two. What should our function do at this intercept? Should it go through the axis or bounce off the axis? That's an even number, so it should bounce. Do you remember doing that? Good, 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 good. Okay, so we've got, actually, the y-intercept and the x-intercept being the same point. Zero gives us a zero, so the x-intercept, zero comma zero, is the same as the y-intercept in this function. That's a nice little thing. C, is there any symmetry? If I plug in negative x, I get the same up here and the same down here, right? What do we call that? We call that even symmetry. What does that mean for the graph of the function? That means we only have to graph half of it. You only need to graph things for positive numbers. Because you're going to get the exact same thing for graphing negative numbers. For one, you get a number. For negative 1, you're going to get the exact same number because of this. So this tells us just graph the right. Okay. D. Are there any asymptotes? Yes. So we can sort of flesh those out. To flesh out asymptotes, you need to do things like this. Something we did a long time ago. We know we can't plug in plus or minus 1, so let's ask ourselves what happens when we try. Let's, let's see what happens when we get really close to plugging in 1, but picking a number just less. Let's see what happens when we plug in something really close to 1, but a little bit bigger. Okay. In both cases, the top is a positive number, and it's divided by a number that is... Actually, in one of the cases, it's positive when we plug in a number just bigger than 1. So we get a number close to 1 divided by a number that's close to something close to 1 minus 1, so it's really small. That's positive infinity. Something close to 1 times 2. Something close to 1 minus 1, but a little less than 1. So this is now a negative number, but very small. Division by something very small gives you very large, but now negative. So we've got an asymptote right there. Our function sort of, on the left of 1, goes down to infinity, and then on the right of 1, comes up to infinity. And we ask ourselves the same question for negative 1, positive, or negative one from the right and from the left. And we're out of time. Like way out of time now, two minutes over. We've got to go to another class. But We'll continue this Monday, and uh, depending on how far we get Monday on optimization, I'll take it out of the test or not, okay? So, I'll see you next time. Yes? Yeah, let me, let me talk about that here.